I'm muted myself. All right. Looking at Psalm 119, uh, section 113 to 120, Psalmic. Uh, it's the Hebrew letter that all these verses start with. So I'm going to read the text, and we're going to walk through. We talked about two, uh, last week, we really focused our attention on uh, that contrast in verse 113. Uh, hating the double-minded, loving your law, and talked about the need to cultivate godly affections. And I think that's a topic that uh, has been written on in, in the past, and it, sometimes it, it gets lost uh, in that reality that we are to love what God loves and hate what God hates, and that requires a cultivation of affections that we actually cultivate in our hearts, a disdain, a hatred for sin. It's in our own life, and sin as it shows up, it sins destructiveness uh, the more you see it, the more you get involved in lives, the more you minister to others and you see the destructive effects of sin that it has in the lives of other people, not only your own. Uh, we all tend to think we're immune to our own sin. We always think that it won't be that bad. That's why you'd ever entertain it in the first place. Um, if you really thought it was going to be that horrible, you wouldn't do it. Uh, so we get deceived, and that's just our nature as sinners. We're easily deceived by sin. And we always think ours isn't that bad. Everybody else's is terrible. Um, but the more you're involved in the lives of people ministering and you begin to see the destructive effects of sin in their life, the more you grow in your hatred for sin. Uh, and that's right. I mean, that's a right response. And, and we need to, to cultivate that as a body of believers, a genuine hatred for sin, and especially as it shows up in our own life. Uh, and so uh, the psalmist says, I hate the double-minded. I love your law. You are my hiding place, my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live. Let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard to your statutes continually. You spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. All of the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you. I am afraid of your judgments. So we'll begin, and uh, we'll see how far we get. But in verse 113, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. So what does it mean to be double-minded? Uh, what is that? concept, what conceptually, and there may be, there's a couple other texts we'll actually look at that probably are maybe even more familiar than this to us. But what does it mean to be double-minded? Okay, to be doubtful. What else? Doubtful of what? <laughs> to be hypocritical. Okay. All right, or competitive value system, okay? You have two really competitive value systems that are not incompatible. At one point in time, it's like, it's, it's the, on Sunday, I love the Lord and the things of the Lord. On Monday, I love the world and the things of the world, okay? That would be double-minded. I, I live in the world like, like my relationship with God doesn't rule that. That would be two, trying to live in two directions. So to be doubtful, to be double-minded, dual in focus, uh, in, in, in all the ideas, and it, it is uh, the reality that uh, to be unreliable, right? Can't be counted on. So, though that's why the psalmist would say, I hate the double-minded. Why? Well, you can't count on them, right? And inherently, uh, people who don't know the Lord are going to be, they might not actually be double-minded. They might just live in, out their full vented hatred of God. But most of those people you and I don't run into because of common grace. Common grace makes the world somewhat decent. The reason why you may have good moral neighbors or co-workers is not because there's good people in the world. That's just not reality. All people are sinners, desperately wicked, and that's true across the board. There's none righteous, no, not one. So why are there good neighbors or good moral people that you run across? Well, because of grace, common grace, extended to even sinners. And so they have a sense of morality about them, and, but yet it's not consistent. You know, they hate if somebody steals from them, but they would cheat and steal themselves. You know, they may not go rob a store, but they will lie about a time card or et cetera, et cetera. They will lie to get ahead. Uh, so they're inconsistent. They're dualistic. They're unstable because their loyalty is really up for sale. Okay? So they, won't, they can't be counted on. And so the psalm is saying, I hate people like that. I hate those who are double-minded because you can never rely on them. They're unreliable. Uh, at any point in time, you and I you know, we can sow to the flesh, we can sow to the spirit. There's no other options. If I'm not walking in the spirit, if I'm not yielding, actively yielding my heart to God's word, God's precepts, living by faith, meaning that what I'm doing, I understand through the word of God to be pleasing to God, 
If I'm not living that way, then I'm beginning to sow to my flesh. When I begin to sow to my flesh, I'm living dualistically or double-minded, okay? I'm living in two directions at the same time. I, if I think I can satisfy the desires of my flesh while disregarding whether that is pleasing to God, there's where instability comes from, right? That's why James would say, right, the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, in all of his ways, exactly. And then in, cha in, in, uh, in, in, ch in context of James, you're familiar with cha chapter 1, you know, we're dealing with trials, and the trials expose our need for wisdom, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally or generously without reproach. And so, but if you're double-minded, but let him ask in faith, not doubting. The double-minded man doubts. And so he doubts what? Well, by context in James, he's doubting that his trial is good. He's not counting it as an occasion for joy. He's doubting that God will, is, really has the wisdom because after all, if God was so wise, I wouldn't be in the trial in the first place. Okay? So that the double-minded person has doubts and entertains doubts about his circumstances and about the character of God and really maligns the character of God. Thus, he is unstable in all that he does. Because he, can't, he really is struggling to trust God. The moment you and I entertain the thought that your trial, the circumstance you're in, cannot be good, we are really, I mean, at that point, I'm impugning the character of God, right? Because if I say, God, this, this is not good, this is terrible, then I'm really beginning to say, well, God, you who are in control of all things must not be very good or very loving or very kind because this circumstance could not be the will of God because it certainly isn't my will, right? So we can begin very quickly uh, to undermine the character of God. And if, when we begin to doubt God's goodness in the midst of trial, are we going to trust God? Are we going to trust what God's word says is the answer to the trial? You know, the, you know if, if I'm doubting God's goodness in the midst of my trial, I'm not looking for God's word for the answers to the trial. Because I think God messed up and allowed me to be in the trial in the first place. So, you know, that's why the double-minded man will be unstable in all of his ways. Because he's doubting the very character and goodness of God. And thus, he's going to look for answers outside of God's word. Right, and that's why a lot of times, and, and we've all, I, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say we've all experienced it, but a long life's journey in ministry, I've had people, you know, they'll come and ask for your pastoral advice. And some people actually want your advice, other people just want you to agree with them. They come and tell you what their plan is, and isn't this the will of God? And you're like, no, not a chance. And they're like, no, it's got to be. Okay, you really didn't come for advice, you came for affirmation. And uh, we, we, at times, we have our plan. And our plan, we, we just, we hold it and we run after our plan uh, and even willfully disregarding whether or not it really is pleasing to God. And that creates all the instability. Like you said, there's nothing stable. If it's just my plan, it has no stability to it. But that's my foolishness. That's the foolishness of sin. I think my plan's better than God's. But... Uh, James chapter 4, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Contextually, in James chapter 4, he, he really calls his readers a very, you know, he uses endearing terms, right? Okay, what in James chapter 4, what does, he, what does he say about his readers? Yeah, they're sinners, but he, he says a little bit earlier they're actually adulteresses because they're loving the world. And you've made yourself a friend of the world. Whoever makes himself a friend of the world is a not a friend of God, as an enemy of God. And so he's saying of his readers, look, you're, you're, that double-mindedness comes up again. Hey, you can't be friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. It doesn't work, right? It's like the Lord said, you're not going to serve two masters. You're going to love the one and hate the other. You're not going to have, you, your, your loyalties cannot be given. That's why we're, we say we're to love God supremely. We're, I mean, our loyalty is to be undivided to the Lord. When it is not, we face and really live double-mindedly, and it creates all the instabilities that we see that the scriptures talk about. So, taking that second half, and he says, all right, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. 
So there's a number of texts uh, in the psalm. I think there's, an, I think I record, wrote it down. Let me get right back to my notes. But I believe it's something like nine different times uh, in Psalm 119. He refers to loving God's word, loving God's commandments, his law, his testimonies, his precepts. And all of this, uh, the psalmist reiterates again and again throughout Psalm 119 that he loves God's word. Why? Because God's word is what keeps him from instability, right? It's what keeps you from, I mean, how do you know the right thing to do? Well, we need an infallible guide, don't we? We need infallible instruction. Where do we find that? Well, we've been given God's word. And God's word gives us the answers. And if we don't know the answer to the circumstance we're uh, facing, we haven't mined enough in the word. Okay? So we need answers from the word of God that keeps us from being double-minded. And it it guards our heart. In fact, the proverb, Proverbs chapter 4, says, Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Guard your heart. What goes in? What rules your affections? Guard it. Because now it's going to come the issues of life. But here's uh, some of the psalms, psalmists speak of loving the Lord. And so what I thought would be interesting tonight, and you guys are all going to look up the verses and fill them in, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So I said, no, no, let's, let's just, I mean, here, here's the psalmist declaration. Lord, I love you. I love you, O oh Lord, my strength. All right, my strength. What else? Okay, my salvation. My redeemer, all right? I'm just asking you how you'd fill in that blank. And think about it. This is the psalmist exclaiming, I love you, O oh Lord, my, my, my God, okay? My what? How you fill in the blank? What do you think of? I mean, yes, the text says strength, all right? All of you passed. You, got, you found, you looked it up, all right? You looked up the blank. Oh, fill in the blank. I got to find it. No, you didn't follow the directions. What comes to your heart? Then we'll see what the psalmist said. So, all right, well, you flunked that one. Now I'll go to the next one. <laughs> I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my, and you know the, so what has God seen? What does God know in our life? Okay, he knows our sin, all right? He knows what? Okay, he knows our our attitude. I take it, but you're referring to. He knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts from afar off. Okay, what else? What's that? Our attitudes, all right? Our spirit, our attitudes, our thoughts, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, how we're responding. My weakness. Our weaknesses. All right, so specifically here, the psalmist speaks of the afflictions, all right? So God knows our afflictions, and he knows, and I can't even read that from there, the distress of my soul. All right, so he rejoices and he's glad because God's steadfast love and connected to that is God's knowledge of the very difficulties we face, right? God knows them all, and none of them are by mistake, none of them are by happen chance. And so God's love is steadfast through all the adversities of life. Aren't you glad? Because we don't escape adversities in a fallen world. And he knows the very distresses that we face, and his love is steadfast. In fact, it's the only thing that holds you. It's what preserves you, right? In fact, you know, God, God's the one that doesn't let go of us. It's not the other way around, okay? <laughs> We're held in his hand, right? And, and we should all be very thankful for that because we, do, we would not do a good job holding on. In Psalm 89, in verse 1, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your your faithfulness, your precepts, your goodness, your salvation, your law. Okay, good. What do we want to make known? What, what, think about it. What do you want people to know about God? I'm the, I, I sing of the steadfast love forever. I'm going to proclaim praise to God forever. I want people to know God's love is an eternal love, an everlasting love, an, a, an unchanging love. And I will make known God's faithfulness. What are we talking about? His love, right? Specifically, when we speak of the cross, we speak of the greatest demonstration ever of the love of God. And so the psalmist says of God's faithfulness, all right, that it is to all generations, I will make known that God is ever faithful to his promises, he's faithful to his people, and I want to make that known to all generations. And so we think through, what do we want people to know about our God? I love the Lord because he has heard 
my cry, okay, my, my plea, my prayers, okay? I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. He's heard everything, absolutely, all right? And the psalmist says specifically, he's heard what? My voice and my pleas for mercy. That's one we could press in a little bit. I won't take a lot of time here, but just think about this. When's the last time in your prayer that God heard your pleas for mercy? Because pleas for mercy is also an acknowledgement of what? Of sin and guilt. I'm guilty and I'm a sinner, and I really don't deserve the kindness of God, but I need his mercy. And so the psalmist says, I, I love you, Lord, because you hear my voice. You listen to your children. That's an amazing thing. I mean, we, we get over that so fast. But the reality is that you and I, wherever we are, can stop and pray, and God listens. I mean, I, I mean I, I've, we raised four children, and they're all adults now. I still have two, one kind of at home a little bit. So. But, you know, along life's journey, at times they were like, Dad, Dad, Dad. You know, not right now. Shh. Dad's, I can't, you know, in a minute, I'll listen to you. Aren't you glad that never happens when you turn to the Lord in prayer? The Lord is never up there saying, hey, wait a minute, your problem? Not big enough for me right now. You know, I'm, I'm, bu I'm busy dealing with a lot of other issues that are a lot more important than you. And that never happens. So God hears our voice. And it is something we should be amazed at and just dumbfounded that the God of heaven who rules over everything cares enough about you and I to listen to our prayers. He hears and he answers according to his perfect will and purposes and he knows exactly our needs and he hears our petition for mercy. And so it's a great lesson about our prayer life. All right, on to verse 114. Sorry, Jim, you had a comment? Go ahead. Sure. Right. Yes. Again, God in prayer better not be, you know, we can treat God like he's the heavenly butler, and that, that, that is, uh, that is uh, not appropriate. Let me just, we can go off on that one, but won't. All right. Psalm 119, verse uh, 114, you are my hiding place, my shield, I hope in your word. So why do we need a hiding place and a shield? I'm sorry, go ahead. Paul? Protection, protection all right. Okay, we need a hiding place, a shield for protection because it's a dangerous world out there, right? And in fact, the psalmist said, and I like his, the psalmist's answer in Psalm, one, in Psalm 32, you are a hiding place for me. This is the only other place this, kind of, this reference is used of God. You're a hiding place for me for you preserve me in my trouble and you surround me with shouts of deliverance. All right, so God is our security, right? He is our protector, and so we, if, if God is that hiding place and shield, then does that mean that we're never going to suffer? No, we will suffer. Okay, all right. So it doesn't mean you're going to be delivered from all pain or adversity. That's not what it means. It does mean this, that you'll never go through any of it meaninglessly or without his help and provision. There will never be a door of suffering that God's going to open up in your life that he is not already going. I mean, he's gone. Through, he knows exactly the good he's accomplishing through it in your life and beyond your life and the life of so many others. And God, in his grace, will sustain you through it. And so it doesn't mean that you're never going to face difficulty or adversity. Contrary to the health and wealth gospelers out there, we want to tell everybody, if you just have enough faith, God's going to make you rich, happy, healthy. Of course, they still get sick, get cancer, die, and so do their family members who they can't raise from the dead. But that's all, you know, another point. But anyway, so no, it's not that. He's not saying that at all. But what he is, but what the application, at least one of the ways I look at it, if God is my hiding place and my shield, then I don't need to fear people. Amen. And it's not that people can't hurt me. They certainly can. But what, I mean, what I am secured in is that God is the one who owns my life who is preserving, protecting according to his perfect will and purposes. And so nothing outside of his plan can ever happen in my life. So I don't need to fear serving him. I should always fear not, okay? 
and we'll get to that. Really, the psalmist ends that way as well. But uh, all right, so God is our, our hiding place and our shield. We are to find our hope in his word. So what does it mean to find our hope in God's word? What are some other words for biblical? When we talk about hope, what are some other words? Because I, I think Americana, the American use of hope doesn't help us biblically, right? Because the American use of hope is, boy, I hope tomorrow's a better day than today. You know, so I hope this happens. I hope that happens, you know. Uh, it's all the hope so stuff. That's not the biblical concept. That's not the Hebrew word means, not the Greek word means. That's not the biblical concept. Okay, my security, my... My assurance, all right? My confident expectation, I like that. It's my confidence and my expectations are all rooted in what God has said. Why? Because of who God is. God makes promises that are absolutely sure. They're sure. They're certain. Why? Because of who he is. And so when I come to the promises of God, I have confident expectation because God is going to accomplish all this, right? Now, all of us would say, okay, let, let it all, you know, because he does say later in this psalm, you know, all the wicked are going to be like dross. You know what dross is, right? You know, is dross any, is valuable? No, it's just burned up, taken off, and discarded, right? All the wicked are going to be discarded. And you're saying, amen, so let it be. Okay, it is going to happen. It is going to happen. Now, we look at the promises at times, and we think, well, let it be now. And the Lord's like, no, wait. My timing is absolutely perfect, and his timing is. So it is our hope, so it's our confidence in the goodness of God, the promises of God with an expectation of the day coming when all of God's promises are going to be fulfilled. The day is coming for everyone in this room who knows the Lord that you will know what fullness of joy is and never again face pain or anything that causes sorrow. We don't know life like that. We don't know a day like that. We don't know a day without bad news. We don't know a day without some level of sorrow and difficulty. We don't know a day without some level of pain. We don't know life like that, but the day is coming when I will experience life in the presence of God, fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore, never again to be diminished by sin. Never again to be diminished by my frailty. Never again to be diminished by, by my own weakness. Never again to ever be diminished. That day is coming. And that is a day to be anticipated, expected. And so that's the kind of hope that we have. And it is to be a confident expectation. Depart from me, ye evildoers, that I may keep the commands of God. So there's something incompatible here. What is it? What doesn't go together? Evildoers and what? Keeping the commands of God. So if you keep company with evildoers, you're not going to keep the commands of God. And that's what he's saying. And, and in fact, he uses, he actually uses uh, the mode of command, or uh, which in this case is really a strong desire. He would like for all evildoers, those who practice evil, to depart from him. Because it, what, every relationship, inherent in every relationship, uh, is, is what? What does every relationship do or have as a com common component? What's that? Influence. Absolutely. Influence is what was the exact word I was looking for, all right? Every relationship brings a level of influence. Now, I put this, I think I, let me, how'd I do it? All right, okay, well. Uh, all right, well, anyway, we'll walk through this, and then I'll get to the other question. I was jumping ahead of myself. All right, so whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. The companion of fool, the companion of fools suffer harm. Uh, leave, the, leave the presence of a fool, for there, for there you do not meet words of, of knowledge. I love that one. You leave the presence, because they don't speak words of A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion, all right? Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. And he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Wisdom is not trusting your own mind. It's not trusting you're smarter than the next guy. Wisdom is knowing what God has to say about a matter and obeying. That's wisdom. Other than that, I'm just being foolish, spouting my own opinion, and all of that's the character of a fool, which all leads to harm and destruction. So, but now when I look at this text, apart from the evildoers... Right? That's really a mode of separation, right? Now, when do we take this counsel too far in our practice? 
Or do we? Can we? All right. Okay, isolationism. Holy huddles. Okay, all right. And here's where this reality is, all right? We're called to, in fact, Jesus has sent us in as the Father sent me into the world, so I send you, right? We've been sent, commissioned into this world to rescue evildoers from their evil ways, right? Through the proclamation of the gospel by which God saves sinners and rescues them from their evil ways. So inherently in the mission that we've been given, we must maintain contact with evildoers, right? Right? If we don't have contact with evildoers, we cannot accomplish the mission. We can't go in the world and make disciples. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, he was accused always, right? He eats with the tax collectors. And, the, you know, he eats with the sinners. No. No. Well, I mean, and that's where this, that's why the second question, what is it really we're trying to avoid? It is not contact. Right. Right. So a lot of you need to quit work. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, you face it, you work with a lot, of, you're going to work with a lot of unsaved people, right? So if you have to say, depart from me, you evildoers, uh, period, I can't have contact with you, then you're going to be really a hermit somewhere. Um, go ahead, Jim. All right. Right. But the companion of the fool will suffer harm. Right, I agree. I mean, I'm not trying to mute the command. I mean, what the psalmist is expressing is that I don't want to have companionship, camaraderie, common cause with those who do evil. Because if I do, I'm going to get sucked into it. That's what he's expressing. So I'm just saying that we, you know, at times the whole issue of, of, of uh, you know, bad company corrupts good morals. Okay, bad company can corrupt you. Uh, that's certainly true. But there's, you know, there, we can go... If you will, we can take it to the extremes where we begin to cut off all contact and relationship with unsaved people. That is not what God's called us to do, ever. Now, wisdom is needed. There may be some relationships you do have to get rid of. I mean, when, you know, depending on when you got saved as an adult and what you were into, there may be certain relationships you just have to walk away from completely because those were strangleholds of sin in your life, and you may have to cut them off completely. Uh, and, but they're going to be, we've been called to engage the world, to come along. If we need relationships with unsaved people, if we're going to be gospel witnesses, we, we, we have to. Now, it, 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 at the moment you are being drugged into evil, then you're going to have to cut off that relationship. Because at that point, it's really not, I mean, it's their influence is now leading you towards sin. That just means right now you're not strong enough for that relationship. You're not, you're not prepared for it. You're not strong enough to enter into it. Yes, Jim? Right. Well, David doesn't want to have companionship, partnership. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, we can unpack this in all kinds of ways. One of the ways the New Testament unpacks this is that we, you know, you, believers don't marry unbelievers. Why? Because we don't have companionship. We don't. And uh, so there's a lot of ways you unpack this reality. Uh, so we don't have a common cause. We don't come into com companionship. And it is a matter of influence. Now, we sh we're going to engage in relationships with unsaved people. Now, the influence, as Ted said, there's a purpose in that relationship. And our purpose is to influence them towards godliness for building relationships, showing them ultimately sin in the gospel so that they might be saved. So it, it just, we need to... Uh, keep in mind, I mean, we're, we're to engage the world with the gospel. That's going to demand relationship. And in that relationship, the gospel needs to drive it. If it does, the purity maintains, and you're never going to win a sinner by sinning with the sinner. It's just not going to happen. So the 
the be like them in the sense of, of, of respecting the people's value systems, that's all well and good. I mean, you know, cultural context, I mean, these gentlemen both ministered in two different cultures. You've got to learn your culture, you've got to learn its context, you've got to learn its value set, and you learn some things that we value and don't value in American culture are due to our culture, not the Bible. And those things are all, those are, those are not absolutes in any way, shape, or form, all right? So that's a whole other conversation. But when we engage with the unsaved world, the influence is the issue. Are you being influenced toward evil? Then those are relationships you're going to have to pull back from. And that's really because your own maturity level is, is being exposed by that. All right. But if you then use that as an excuse not to be witnesses, we're disobedient in a whole other way. So we've got, to, we've got to grow up spiritually so we can engage as good soldiers in the battle for the Lord. We just know that's what we have to do. All right, a couple more texts. Verse 116, 117, Uphold me according to your promise that I may live. Let me not be put to shame in my hope. Uphold me that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. So the psalmist is asking God to do what? To protect him, to lift him up, to strengthen him, right? Strengthen me, uphold me. In the midst of this adversity, this difficulty, he says that I may live. So it's actually whatever the circumstance is, is could be life-threatening. And he is, he is at, he's crying out to the Lord, Lord, you uphold me, you protect me, you strengthen me in this situation. Okay? And then he, he, he answers, really suggests, why should God answer this prayer? Okay, so he would have regard for statues. How about in the verse 116? He says, let me not be put to shame in my hope. My hope is in your word, right? My hope's in your word. I love your word. My hope is in your word. And so he's crying out to God, according to God's promises, you uphold me. Because if God, if you don't keep your promises, Absolutely. Now, don't let me be put to shame. Really, it's more of, of God, if I am shamed because my hope is in you and your promises, then your character is going to be maligned. That's, that's how he's pulling that together. And so he's rooting this, this, argue, this, uh, this petition. And I, I, again, uh, you know, it, it may sound, I, I hope it doesn't sound irreverent when I say in, in, when you uh, pray, there's actually, you engage in somewhat of a biblical argument of why God should answer prayer. It's not meant to be irreverent. It's meant to cause you to think. Are you really just praying out desires? Are you praying according to God's purposes and, his, and, and what God has revealed? And how will God answering that prayer further God's purposes? That's really what the psalmist is suggesting. God, you upholding me is furthering your purposes, what you have promised to accomplish. So, Lord, you answer this because it is in accord as, as the psalmist, again, now, divinely inspired, so a little bit, he's saying this circumstance is according to your promises. I'm claiming those promises, and Lord, don't let me be put to shame, because the source of my hope is you. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And I would like to, if I can put it kind of, and I don't think I put these texts up there, I didn't. But here, just kind of a maybe example in, in us praying according to the promise of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, a familiar verse in verse 13. No temptation is overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear or endure it, right? So the promise is your trial, my trial, is nothing unique. We don't like that part of it, because <laughs> we all feel it sometimes, man, this is so hard. Nobody's ever had it as hard as me. I've got the pity party going. You want to join me? All right, so we've all been there. Uh, hopefully you didn't buy the T-shirt. Anyway, so, you know, we, we've come to the place, but, but God is saying there, look, what you're facing is not unique. And in the midst of your difficulty, God has not ceased to be faithful. And God is promising in the midst of that difficulty that the difficulty you're facing is not greater than his grace. I mean, it's an absolute promise. In the midst of your difficulty, it is not greater than your grace. God is going to provide in the midst of that difficulty a way of an escape. Escape from what? We often take it as escape from the trial, but the next phrase just mitigates that one because he says that you may be able to bear it, endure it. So the escape doesn't have to do with getting out of the trial. What is the escape from? Sinning in the midst of the trial. 
So in the midst of the difficulty, know this, your difficulty is common. It is the common experience of humanity in a fallen world. You're facing difficulties and trials. And God is faithful, and that faithfulness is part then connected to a promise that you are not facing anything beyond God's grace enabling you to endure it. And he is in the midst of that providing a means of escape through his word, through fellowship with God, I mean through all the means of grace, which are the word, his people, worship, uh, prayer, all of those means of grace that God is giving. God provides you a way of escape from what? From sin, from doubting his goodness in the midst of the trial, that we may be able to endure it. All right? Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, to, you know, Paul's, God's comment to Paul is Paul prayed for God to relieve his affliction. And God's promise to Paul is, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul's reply then is, I will glory then in my weakness. Okay? So as we face afflictions, we pray, Lord, in the midst of this affliction, you have promised that this affliction is not greater than your grace's ability to sustain me. So Lord, I need your grace. And let me not be put to shame according to my hope. My hope is in your provision of grace. And your provision of grace will sustain this sinner in this trial so that I might not doubt you and sin against you. And so I claim the promise of God. God, you promised that there's no trial that is greater than your grace. You you are faithful in the midst of this trial. You'll sustain me if I cry out for grace. And I'm asking, Lord, grant me grace. Grant me strength. Be that shield. Be that protection in the midst of this trial. And Lord, help me to really know and believe that your grace is sufficient because it is. God's grace is always sufficient. Sometimes I cringe every now and then. I, I, and, I, and if you've ever said this, and maybe I've even said it before, so you can correct me if I have, but sometimes I hear people will pray, well, I just pray in the midst of this that the Lord would prove himself faithful and that his grace would be proven sufficient. And both of those things kind of cause me to cringe because I go, God doesn't need to prove himself. He is faithful. His grace is sufficient. There is not a question there. So don't pray like that's a question. Don't pray like, God, I really hope your grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. God is faithful. And so we cry out based on the promises of God. And I just thought it might be helpful to think through how do we take promises and put them into prayer. The psalmist does it all the time. And so it's one of the great blessings you get from studying the psalms. All right, we're almost done. 118, 119. You spurn all who go astray from your statutes. For their cunning is in vain, and all the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. God, I love the way you rule the world. It's going to be all right. And then he cries. So who, who does God spurn? The spurn means to do what? what what's another words for spurn? To discard, to what? Sorry, Matt, what, what was that? Uh, wrong hand, okay, spurn. What do you think of when you say spurn? If you spurn somebody, you what? You reject them, okay? It's, you, if you spurn somebody, they, that's, you, you weren't real friendly to them, right? Okay, you've made it really clear you don't really have much use for them. Okay, God does not have any use for people who do what? Go astray from his statutes. God doesn't have any use for people to say, I have a better way than God's. Or those who live like there is no God, who run life according to their own rules, who say, hey, I can make it work. But the world thinks they're very cunning, don't they? They think they're cunning. They think they're smart. They think, man, I, I'm, I'm doing all this stuff, and, and it's against what the Bible has to say, and I don't care about the Bible's a storybook anyway, and I can run my life this way, and I can say these things are okay, and we can kill babies, and we can or, or ordain uh, mer- you know, mer- anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on my political soapbox in a minute. No, I won't do it. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, that is the means that they were thrown out. Right. For spurning, going astray. I mean, yeah, they going astray, right. No, it's a good illustration. But the world thinks they're very cunning. I mean, the, the unsay people think they're smart, and they think they're getting away with it. The world looks at their sin, and, hey, we can do this. And, and what the Bible simply says is all their cunning, all their craftiness, and the world's crafty about sin. They're creative. 
I mean, they are. They're creative. I mean, the people got massive counterfeit. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that the world creates, you know, steals to try and gain wealth, right? The world's creative. And they think that, they, that they're... It says all their cunning is vain. It's absolutely empty because no one pulls anything over on the God who knows everything. And the day of justice, so remember this, because the times of the pain and the affliction we go through, we can be victimized, we can. We can be the victims of somebody else's evil, and it always is painful to be on that side of the equation. It's, it should be as painful to us when we victimize somebody else. I mean, to be honest, when we've gotten angry or whatever and sending it to somebody else, that should break our heart as much as being the recipients. It doesn't because we're selfish sinners, okay? But... I mean, when we're on the side of victimized, there can be at times, well, 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 that person got away with it, and how can God, wait, 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 wait. The day of justice is coming. The day when those who have discarded, I mean, those who have turned away from God's law and lived lives in rebellion against God and thought they were smart and crafty and thought they were getting ahead, we're going to meet the just judge of the universe. And all wickedness will be gone forever. That day is coming, and it is a certain promise from God. And therefore, the New Testament unpacks that in all kinds of ways, like we're not supposed to take vengeance, we're supposed to love our enemies, all of the ways the New Testament unpacks it, because we don't have to worry about justice being served. The God is, our God is a God of justice. And so the last thing the psalmist says, uh, all right, sorry, I didn't put this, but the last thing he says here is, my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I'm afraid of your judgments. So how do we rightly live in fear of God's judgments while celebrating no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Hmm? Okay. Mm -hmm. Judgment. Yeah. yeah, we like the New Testament God. He's a God of love. Yeah, right. And, uh, right. I think, yeah, and I agree totally what you're saying. What I'm kind of fleshing out here, sorry to use the double entendre here, but the fleshing out here is, is the beginning of wisdom is live in. You know, the warning text, and I could walk you through all of them. I mean, there's some profound warning text in the book of Hebrews. Like that, you know, and, and those warning texts are written to believers to warn them about the very fact because people, the, you, I mean we live in a, a country where 70 something percent still profess to be Christians, right? And something like 46 percent profess to be born again believers. Do you believe 46 percent of the people you meet are born again Christians in America? Okay, so what are they then? They are self-deceived, okay? The warning texts are written to people who profess faith. A believer actually embraces the warning texts by faith, fears ever turning away from God so that he would ever be proven a self-deceived professor rather than one who actually believes. The people who have no fear of the warning text, those who turn back, and, and I mean, I can put the text up here. I mean, I think I put it. I did. No, I did here, this is the author of Hebrews. If we go on sibling, sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a fearful expectation of judgment and fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. And you can unpack it. That's written to believers. And the way a believer embraces the warning text of God is, I will never turn from God. Because those who turn would evidence that they're merely a professor, one who has never experienced genuine redemption. And so true believers embrace the warning passage. I know these warning texts have been, and I'm thinking about preaching through Hebrews, so I'll clarify all this 
uh, as we go through it. But the warning texts have been twisted on their ears for years. People are going to lose rewards. People are gonna, no, this is talking about the reality of salvation or not. And those who, having professed to have received the knowledge of Christ, turn back again to a path of sin, go on in deliberate sin, are people who have never really been redeemed. They're professors. And true believers fear that ever being true about them. So that's why you fear sin, because sin always takes you further than you ever intended to go. Sin is a deceiving thing, and you don't ever want to be proven somebody who was self-deceived about your relationship with God. And thus you fear entertaining sin. So this would never be said of you. And then the other side of it is simply this. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't regard it lightly. at this point, being in class. But Compton, Dr. Compton would pray, Lord, help me to always fear ever living in such a way that you would need to discipline my life. That's a right thing. Thus the psalmist says, Lord, I fear you. My flesh trembles at the reality of your judgment. And so there's a right place for the fear of God's judgment in the life of a believer. And it functions to stir us on to love and good works. It's really where it functions. All right, so let's close in.